a few minutes after, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Our Almighty God and Father, we humbly approach your throne this evening. We approach your throne, Father, forever blessed that we have this opportunity to gather together around your word. For your word gives us hope in these troubling times. We know that it's your word by which we should direct our steps. Father, we pray that you would be with those of our number who are sick, those uh, physically ill, those that are spiritually hurting, and refresh our minds that we might do what we can where we can with what we have in order to assist them and to help them understand your mercy and your grace. Father, we pray that as we go throughout this period of study, that it is a true account of your word, knowing that we have been afforded this, this chance for a brief period of time, and that we would look to your word and, and lift it up above all else. Forgive us where we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. John chapter 3, or 4, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I heard some people say, oh, not again. <laughs> now, John chapter 4. Uh, so, of course, we've been talking, I mean, the entire chapter pretty much is about the woman at Jacob's well. And we looked at and left off with him uh, telling her to call her husband. We really finished there. And left off uh, to pick up with verse 19. And I think one of the last things that I said is that if you notice going through the chapter how there's a, a, a progression of respect and, and understanding towards him first, you know, he goes from being a Jew to, to a sir to, to a prophet and, and then to her, you know, questioning, is, is this Christ? So I, I will just, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 19, but I just want to... Uh, Start reading back in verse 16 for a little bit of context, just a little bit. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you, have, you now have is not your husband. What you have, what you've said is true. Then in verse 19, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem... It's the place where people ought to worship. So instead of listening to Jesus and what he's just said about it's true that you don't have a husband, you've had five, and even the one you have now, he's not your husband. Instead of paying attention to that, she tries to get him to, to detour the conversation a little bit. She doesn't acknowledge necessarily anything that he says, only to say that, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, and then she moves immediately over to talking about uh, worship and wants to discuss the difference between uh, the Jewish and the Samaritan religions. Um, you know, we think about it as, you know, there are certain conversations that are uncomfortable for people to have. Conversations about money, conversations about politics, conversations about religion. But she would rather discuss religion than the state of her sin. If that gives us any idea. And, you know, it, it's always easier to do that. We, we never want the, the finger pointed at us when it comes to sin and, and something that we've, we may be doing wrong. But Jesus, once again, he, he revealed to her uh, spiritual ignorance. She did not know who to worship, uh, really. She did not know where to worship, how to worship. And he made it clear that all religions are not equally acceptable before God. And that some worshipers act in ignorance and unbelief based on what she's saying. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, uh, but uh, you, a Jew, a sir, you know, one I think might be a prophet still, is a, y'all say that in Jerusalem is where we are to worship. And we have to consider some other texts. If you take notes, Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, would probably uh, be well applied here. Does anybody know offhand as to what that says? 
Acts 17, 30 and 31. The times of ignorance that God overlooked, but now he commands uh, men everywhere to repent uh, because he has appointed a day in which the, he's going to judge the world in, in righteousness by a man whom he's appointed. And he's given assurance to everyone by raising him from the dead. So just as when Jesus is going through, in this case Samaria, near the city of Sychar, uh, Jacob's well, and he's talking to her and she turns the conversation toward religion as opposed to addressing what he's just said about her own sin, is he's, he's revealing to her, uh, or he will here in a moment, that ignorance, it's only going to play for so long. Just as we look at the, the time now that we live in, uh, there's no reason for people to be ignorant of God's word if the church is doing what the church should be doing, uh, which is spreading the word of God. Uh, you know, we have the Bible in various translations to include Braille for those who can't see. You know, there's audio for people who cannot read. Uh, there's electronic for people who just ooh, hate the touchy-feely of books. Right? And there's social media, there's television, there's radio, there's all types of mediums to get the word out there. Their only excuse that some people may have regarding the gospel is very much like we sing on some Sundays. In fact, I believe we sang it this last Sunday. Is that you never told, you never told me about it, right? Uh, you, you never told me of him. And that's, that's where the responsibility is. Yes, I, I, I know I'm getting some of the lyrics wrong. You never mentioned him to me. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. You never mentioned him to me. I heard y'all. <laughs> so ignorance is only going to, you know, today, there's not really an excuse other than the fact that the church is not doing its job is that it's not fulfilling that part of the commission in going out and reaching the lost. And I know that we talked about this on Sunday a few weeks ago, is that the mission field does not necessarily have to be on some foreign soil. The mission field is your own neighborhood. You know, as soon as you step out the door, that's the mission field. Right? But he says, well, does anyone have any comments or, or thoughts on that? Okay. But in verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. I, uh, I know he's not saying it this way. Yeah. But I can still just picture it. Woman, <laughs> you need to believe this. <laughs> believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Now, it was a devastating statement to say that worship would no longer be limited to the Jewish people or to the Jewish temple, rather. And that ties in to John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, and Christ saying, you know, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Now, we know that he's talking about his body. He's talking about the resurrection there. But it plays also into Acts 7, verses 48 through 50. Uh, Acts 7, verses 48 through 50 Read, yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Do not my hands make all these things? John's gospel clearly reveals that there is a new sacrifice, that there is a new temple, a new birth, uh, a new water, uh, Jews reading this gospel, and they should realize that God has established in Christ a, a whole new spiritual economy, if we were to look at it that way. And the old covenant, the law, will be fulfilled in him and is then set aside to make way for the law of Christ. Now, that does not mean that we do not learn from the old law. There's plenty in the Old Testament for the new Christian, for the experienced Christian. For example, if you're not already familiar, you take a look at the Ten Commandments. Okay? The first four commandments are really man's relationship to God. Not making any graven images, taking his name in vain, what have you. 
And then the second set, you know, 5 through 10, is really our relationship with our fellow men. Murder, covetousness, and what have you. And we get to the New Testament, technically the Old Testament, because Christ hasn't died on the cross, but uh, we're in the Gospel accounts. And a young man, a young lawyer, asks him, what is the great commandment? And what's his reply? So love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then without missing a beat, he says, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Well, that really is a summarization of the entirety of the law. Loving God. Loving people. So we could sum it up in the sense that this man says, you know, okay, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Because some people would say that it was the first commandment. Some would say that it was the fifth. Some would say that it was the tenth. You know, okay, I'm not going to covet, but this coveting, it brings all of this. So maybe that's the great one. So we ask Jesus, you know, what, what's the great commandment? Because I don't know. Is he going to say one? Is he going to say five? Is he going to say ten? And Jesus essentially says, well, if I had to think about it, the greatest commandment would be numbers one through four. And the second would be numbers five through ten. Right? It's all circled around those things. And so when we come to this, this idea of, of worshiping God, that he's not going to be worshipped in, in uh, a physical temple, that there is this new sacrifice, new water, new birth, this whole new economy. Is that yes, we do have the Old Testament to learn from, but we have to be careful that we're not falling into the patterns of the New Testament. Because a lot of New Testament Christians will pull verses out of context simply because they seem to fit. And, and we do need, we need to be careful of that. Christ, and one of the things, the separation between the Samaritans, uh, which again were kind of a considered a pagan uh, people because they were not pure Jew because they had married foreign nations many, many years ago, um, is that there is a certain ignorance there. And he gets into that when he says in verse 22, you worship what you don't know. And we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. The only faith at that point that God will accept is that which came through the Jews. Uh, the Bible is of a Jewish origin. Our Savior was a Jew. The first Christians were Jews. It, it, at that point, it was not even open to the Gentiles. You remember when Christ sent out the apostles, what he told them to do, or not to do, rather? Anybody? Not go to the Gentiles? Right. Any town of the Samaritans? Either? Right. But salvation is of the Jews. Strictly speaking, Jesus, he, he makes no direct pronouncement on the merits uh, of whether it's worshiping in Jerusalem or worshiping Mount Gerizim, where, where she was talking about. But he insists that you worship what you don't know. No, no Jesus isn't saying it's Samaritans hold to a view of God that makes him completely unknowable. Uh, still, less that they worship what they do not believe, as if, it was a, as if he was attacking their sincerity uh, of worship. Right? Um, rather, he's saying that the object of their worship is in fact unknown to them. Uh, they stand outside the stream of, of God's revelation, if you will. The prophets... Uh, of the, that Jewish origin because the Samaritans had separated them, themselves off. And what they worship, they cannot be characterized as truth and knowledge. Just as there are people today who worship not in spirit and truth, they worship according to the traditions of men, their own doctrine. It is not as though God is unknown to them. They're familiar with God. They're familiar with the God of Scripture. And yet... They are so far removed because of how they worship. And these times of ignorance, God, he's not overlooking that anymore. We have the complete revelation, literally from Genesis to Revelation. Right? Um, any thoughts or, or comments or clarifications? 
some confused looks. That's okay. Just boiling it down, she says, the Samaritans say, our fathers say worship here, you Jews say worship there. What? You said, you don't know what you're worshiping. There's coming a time when, when you're not going to worship at either place. Right? In fact, he continues in verse 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, you've heard me say it plenty of times. It's great to have a building. Wonderful. We get to come in in August out of the heat, get to the air conditioning, there's indoor plumbing, we can get water, you know, and all that fun stuff. But we have to remember that this is not God. Right? God is God. We are God's people. We can worship Him in a building. We can worship Him in a parking lot. We can worship Him in a field. We just need to worship in spirit and in truth. It's not necessarily the physical location that matters. Now, that being said, there is the caution of avoiding the very appearance of evil. I don't know how many of you maybe remember, I think it was about a year ago when bar churches started becoming really, really popular. Anybody remember that? It's like, okay, we can't get the people who are, you know, drinking on a Sunday morning in a bar uh, to come to worship services. So what we'll do is we'll bring the worship service to them. And so they, you know, would, uh, there, there was one, I think it was over in Lubbock actually as well. Uh, where they would uh, have worship services in the bar. As far as where the building goes, we still do need to abstain from the very appearance of evil, okay? So, if you got a choice, worship in a field, not in a bar, you know? You drink your grape juice, I'm going to drink my Jack Daniels. You know, that's, we really don't need that. Um, and in fact, as far as worship goes, we have, for the most part, forgotten a lot of the reverence to it. I mean, we have drive-through worship now at banks in Georgia. Old banks that have been turned in. You can go press a little button, hear a devotional on the little screen that the teller would normally pop up on. And you've got your little, and there's your communion thing. And you can put in your money, and hey, you're good to go. Ten minutes. Quicker than cash in a chat. But we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, he says here, the hour now is. Christ was the center of these worshipers. And about him, about Christ, was the was the gathering, the gathering the discipleship of, of true worship. That hour is and the hour comes, right? The point is not winning arguments. The point is not winning arguments, but it's introducing people to the dimension of God in, in their lives. There's a lot of people, I'll just tell you right now, um, and you may have seen it if, if you're a friend of mine on Facebook. I've got a 22-year-old niece who for probably about the last week, week and a half or so, has been going on left and right about miracles. And she's been healed, and she has the power to cast out demons. And if she wanted to drink poison, she could. And, you know, all, all this, this type of stuff. And I've given her every possible scripture that I can think of. And it just starts circling back to, well, where does Jesus say, I can't do this? Where does the Bible say, I can't do this? Or disciples can't do this? Or it was only for apostles that they could do this? The point with the evangelism here in John chapter 4 is not necessarily about winning arguments, but it's, it's in introducing them to God. If we're introducing people to Christ, if we're introducing them to the God of the Scripture and not the God of their opinions, then they're either going to accept it or they're going to reject it. We can't control that. I mean, has anyone here ever had a Bible study with 100% conversion? I would love to talk to you if that's the case. To where the people are still faithful you know, years down the line. 
Jesus did not convert everybody that met him. And he didn't necessarily go running after people that rejected him either. It's a, this evangelism that he's got going on in John chapter 4, it's introducing himself to her, God to people's lives. The, in the model of Christ, it, it's very instructive. He turned the conversation away from a place of worship to the nature of worship. Right? And, and in doing, he, he modeled a, a really correct evangelistic perspective in not focusing so much on the external. It's not about this mountain. It's not about this temple. It's about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Right? Now, I know that we sometimes, especially if you've read the old Leroy Brownlow book, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, you know, and there's a chapter in there, with, you know, the biblical name and, and what have you. The Church of Christ, it used to be you knew what it was when you walked in the door. Right? You knew that there was no vocal instruments. You knew that it was communion. You know that there weren't women in leadership positions and what have you. Now you walk through the door and it's a shot in the dark. Harry's saying it's, it's about the internal. It's worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and that's what we're supposed to be looking at. The time that was coming, well, before I get on the time, anybody thoughts, comments, complaints? Yes, sir. I think you've made we're at a really good point. We worry so much about, uh, I'll say it way I want to say it. The power is in the gospel, the gospel of power of salvation. Mm -hmm. So the more that we take ourselves out of the picture, you know, worry about our success, and more about sharing the gospel with people, sharing Jesus with people, like what we're saying, in truth. Not worry about whether they reject it or not. I mean, it's more pleasant when they do. And God promises us something. He says that His Word will not come back void. Yeah. And so, uh, while the devil tries to discourage us from being intentional in that, and throwing up all these roadblocks, and uh, helps us just to hide in our church buildings, and hide in our houses, and just hide behind our careers. We really need to get uh, motivated to be intentionally excited. Uh, we have the cure for sin. What happened to sin? God fixed it. Yeah. Okay. If you had the cure for cancer, we wouldn't be sitting on it. And we do. And so yeah, we just sit there, okay, intentionally, how are we going to bump into people? And yeah, God's going to throw some people in our way. I, I know. God's going to do some things. Um, but we need to be very intentional and have our and be praying for God to open our eyes because He puts people in front of us. But we're so, you know, sometimes we're we get so busy with all the junk we have to do that we are not uh, sure we're not looking. Sure. We're just like, okay, we present to God. I mean, after all, we weren't fools when we accepted Christ, were we? I mean, we kind of thought about it. And, I mean, we had our challenges and still do. But sure. The truth will win the day. Truth sets people free from sin. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to your point, we, we often forget the simplicity of the matter. Yeah. It, it wasn't, when, I mean, you think back, and you've heard me say it before, when you, when someone was talking to you about the gospel, and maybe it was different, maybe you were reared in, in a home where that was prevalent and always there. Maybe not. But if you weren't, you think about when someone first started to talking to you about Christ, the Lord's church, was it really some deep theological conversation where they were defining Greek words or, or anything? No. It's a very simple gospel. And, and it's a simple message. And the same simplicity that converted you converts other people. Right. And, and his, his word will not return void. It is the power of God's salvation. We plant, someone waters, God gives the increase. Right? But he gives it on his time, not ours. Yes, sir. i got a good friend who's in Phoenix, and Phoenix is in the Bible Belt. Right. Okay. They've baptized 37 since the first of the year. Wow. And they even shut down more than we have. Yeah. Now, yes, I mean, John's probably got some talents and technique, man, I'm going to fly out there <laughs> and just say, what can I pick up from you? And all I'm saying, in our present time, with all the trouble going on, uh, 
gospel can really start touching people. We just got to open up and keep uh, keep planting potatoes, and we'll get some spuds in the end. So we got to be planting. Sure, absolutely. Any other thoughts or comments? The time that was coming. So the hour is uh, the hour is coming. The time that's coming is the time when the true worshipers would no longer need to go to Jerusalem. And because Jesus is dead, the resurrection, the sending of the Spirit uh, would usher in a new way of worship. Uh, you have to remember the Jews going to Jerusalem, you know, for three pilgrimage feasts all of their life. In the Old Testament, they would, on their way to Jerusalem, they would sing the Psalms of David and Solomon, and that's how they would put them into memory. Even now, people go to the Wailing Wall, you know, part of the temple. Uh, that's still in that belief system. And, and you know, with Jesus and this new spiritual economy, it's not about the physical so much as it is the spiritual. Now, don't get me wrong, there are physical elements, obviously, that people add to it. You don't need to know a person's heart to know if they're worshiping somewhere where there's pianos and guitars and everything else, that they're not really worshiping in spirit and in truth. You don't even need to know an individual to do that. But but that would, this would usher in a new way of worship. The, the time could loosely uh, could be loosely said as now come, because Jesus, he had already set in motion the things would, that would bring in this new worship. Remember, on the way to Jerusalem, he stops and calls the twelve to him, and he says, "See, we're going into Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. He's going to be arrested." They're going to spit on him. They're going to curse at him. They're going to mock him. They're going to crucify him. And he's going to be raised up in, in three days. Jesus set this in motion. So he could very... Uh, so in that, the hour is coming and is now here, maybe because he has already set things in, in motion for that. And, and the Father seeks the people who are going to worship him in, in spirit in accordance with the teaching of Christ. And it's a reminder that worship is not restricted to what we do when we come together in church, but it's also about the way we relate to God uh, through the Spirit and according with the teachings of Christ. And really, that touches all of our lives. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth, understanding God, having a relationship with Christ is not just when we gather together at you know such and such time on Sunday mornings for class and then worship. It touches every aspect of our lives, or at least it should. Right? An hour is coming and is now here. And really it's a unique expression uh, to the Gospel of, of John that conveys both a future expectation and a, and a present reality. Uh, Jesus' work in the present inaugurates this new phase in redemptive history. Jesus is Phrasing also echoes the language of Old Testament prophets. Does anybody mind reading Jeremiah 31, 31? Jeremiah 31, 31, and then 2 Kings 20 and verse 17. Because I want us to see that, that what Jesus is saying again is echoing what people had been saying before. So, Jeremiah 31, 31, and then 2 Kings 20. In verse 17. Jeremiah 31, 31. <clears throat> Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Here. Anybody have 2 Kings 20 and verse 17? Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Thank you. The, the idea of the language is that there is a, there's the future expectation. Right? The hour is coming and now it's just, when, just like we're looking, we look at there in Kings, we look in Jeremiah. Is that there is a time coming when I'll do this. But God had already set things in motion. Christ, the cross, that was not an afterthought. That was always the plan, right? And Jesus telling her this is that it's something that's happening right now because it's already in motion, but it's not fulfilled yet. That's that hour is coming and is now here. Right? It's kind of, well, is, is it coming? 
Is it here? I mean, again, we're talking to a Jew who's walked across the desert. And he's hot. He's hungry. Maybe a little touched in the head. So what's he talking about here? So it's just that language. Things are in motion. And, and today there, there's many people who worship God in the right spirit, but they don't worship him in truth. And you have to have both if you're going to be pleasing to God. There are plenty of people who I see they've got a smile on their face from ear to ear, and you talk to them, and they are just, I love God so much. He's so great. They're, and they're not afraid or, or ashamed to, to act that way, right? There are some of them that I look at, you're a little off. And then there are some who, man, I wish I was feeling that way right now. So they've got the right spirit, but then they go off and, you know, the kiss their little baby Jesus bobblehead that's sitting there on the dashboard of their car going back and forth and, you know, they're going to worship over here where the band is just all over the place. And so they've got the right spirit, but not the right truth. And so if we're going to be pleasing to God, we have to have both, right? And when we come to worship God, Yes, there is a reverence there. There is a solemnity there. But at the same time, remember, we're not coming to a funeral. Right? There should be a lot more smiles on Sunday morning. And y'all guys have heard me. When I'm, Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Morning. Yes, like you're in morning. No, come on, let's pick it up, people. All right? But he says, the woman said to him, I know that... Uh, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who you speak, who speak to you am he. And, and also sometimes uh, in your Bible you might have that uh, he who is called Christ in parentheses, or it might be in, in italics. That's a clarification there. Sometimes what's in the parentheses is in the original text. Sometimes it's put it there by the translators to clarify what's been said. Um, in this particular instance, it is in the original text. That he who is called Christ. And it's an interesting statement. I who speak to you am he, meaning that I am the Messiah you're talking about. And it's interesting for a couple of reasons. Because first, Messiah means Christ. It means the anointed one. Right? But second, the term Messiah, it's only found twice in the New Testament. There's other times it's talked about in the Old Testament, about the Messiah coming. But in the New Testament, it's only used twice. It's used once here, and then once in John 1 and verse 41. Those are the only two references for the word Messiah. Whether it's King James, New American Standard, NIV, New King James, uh, what have you. But third, because it's Jesus. Now, a lot of people believe that, you know, you've heard Jesus called Yeshua, right? Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, uh, loose translated uh, from Yahshua, Joshua. Yah meaning God, Shua meaning saves, right? So Yahshua, Jesus, God saves. Uh, we know also from... From his birth, uh, you can call him Jesus, he's going to save his people. But it's interesting because he's telling someone flat out that he's the Messiah. And he's, and he's not saying it to a Jew. Saying it to a Samaritan woman who everybody else would have shown. But a, because of a woman. B, because of her lifestyle. C, because she was a Samaritan or whatever order you want to put it in. And it's very similar to statements like that he would make elsewhere in John before Abraham was, I am. Refer referencing back to Exodus and Moses questioning, well, when they say who sent me, what am I going to say? Like, I am. You know? Or another phrase, you know, also in John, I and the Father are one. That we're one. Or uh, when he uh, makes himself equal. With God, One of the two reasons that they really tried to go after him, uh, the scriptures say in John that it was because one, he was healing on the Sabbath, and two, because he made himself equal with God in John 5, verses 17 and 18. And it's interesting that all of these references 
of him referring to himself as God in a roundabout way occur in John. They're not really anywhere else. And part of that is because the audience that it's written to, remember John is a metropolitan gospel, it's for everybody. Whereas with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you've got it you know, addressed to Jews or Greeks or Gentiles, whatever the case may be. Gentile slash Roman, or Greek Roman. So it's interesting that saying, you know, I'm, the, I'm the anointed one. I'm the one that you're talking about who was coming. That's me. And I just told you that I would give you living water that you would never thirst. And you and so you weren't understanding that. So then I went with your personal <coughs> life. And you didn't really like that. So then you tried to change the subject over here. So okay, now you finally kind of ask a question. I'm going to tell you, that's me. I am the anointed one. I am Yeshua, the Messiah. God saves. And, and just then, in verse 27. His disciples came back. They marveled that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said to him, "Why do you? Uh, what do you seek? Or, or why are you talking with her?" And we're not going to spend any time on that verse because we had already <coughs> discussed previously about her being out there by herself, and you know, not at, at, at midday and not in the morning or the evening in the groups and what have you. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, "Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did." Can this be the Christ? Can this be the anointed one? Just because they were Samaritans and they were rejected by the Jews did not mean that they weren't religious people. They were very religious people. And that's and this is all that we know of what she said to the people. You know, just come and see a man who told me that I everything I ever did, could this be the Christ? Now, even if that's all she told them, there is an indication here that the man, could this man be, or come see a man, is that he would have been seen as a stranger. It doesn't mean she, you know, that uh, she told the people that he was a Jew and not a Samaritan in, in the strictest sense. Uh, she could have, we don't know. If we go with the thought that she was a woman, as we were saying before, a woman of ill repute, and that's why she was out there alone at that particular time of the day, then it, it may be that they found it strange that there was someone who didn't know the woman, but was still able to tell her everything that she had done. Uh, we, really don't, we really don't know if that's all that she said, only that that's all recorded. So they went out of the town, verse 30, and they were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. It's very much a cross-reference there might be Matthew 7, verses 9 and 10. Which one of you, if his son asks for bread, his, you know, his father will give him a stone. Or if he asks for fish, he'll give him a serpent. Uh, James puts this this way. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are but a mist that appears for a little time, and then you're gone, and then you vanish away. There in John, or James 4, verses 13 and 14. So, Y'all are so focused about everything else. I've got something y'all don't even have a clue about. So the disciples, verse 33, they said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Again, still focused on the physical. Jesus said to them, my food, I'm going to explain it to you, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do, not, do you not say, yet yeah, there are four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. We're in the mission field. And we've already talked about right now, you know, we're in the mission field. There are souls that need saving. Uh, there are people out there. The fields are ready. People are interested. People are interested. They're interested in God. They're interested in the kingdom. They're interested in Christ. But how many times have we heard people say, Christians, say, well, I don't want to go door knocking, just as an example, because no one's really interested. 
No one wants to come to services anymore. I just get the door slammed in my face. Or why would I try? Why would I try inviting, you know, the cashier at you know Quick Trip or something to to services? They're they're not actually going to come. What's what's the point? Well, yeah, it's it's like I said last week. Wayne Gretzky, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take, right? The more doors you knock, the greater your odds increase of finding someone. Here was a woman, the town wasn't around, the other women weren't with, she was a Samaritan, so the Jews weren't going to her. Christ went to her and she was ready. And she was willing. And went and told everybody else about it. But we have this attitude, when we have the attitude that people aren't interested, the church stops working. And then often it becomes... That's what we send money to missionaries for, right? So that they can go off and talk to people. Or, hey, Mike, isn't that why you get a paycheck every week? Because, I mean, we pay you. That's what we pay you to do. We pay you to do it, so I don't have to do it. Now, I'm not saying that's, that's true of everybody, but let's face it, if you've been in the church for any length of time, you know that's the attitude of some, just from your personal conversations. When the Lord's people stop working. Now the church is never going to die. God's not going to let that happen. But a congregation can. Very easily and very quickly. But he continues, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans, from, and many Samaritans from that camp, town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Now that's their initial belief. <clears throat> she engages with Christ. She goes tell the, to the town. And come see this man. He's told me everything that I ever did. Could it be the Christ? And so it says that they believed because of what she had said. And, and I'll tell you why that I call that their initial, her, their initial belief. Today we might hear it called testimony. It's my testimony or, or the confession of a Christian or what have you. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer. Because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Okay, so their initial belief, what caused them to actually leave their homes and go out there, was what the woman said, right? But then after that, when Christ is there for two days, they believe his word, and they say, it's no longer because of what you said. It's because we heard what he said. And if what's happened in other places around Jesus is concerned, he speaks as one who has authority, not as the scribes. And they believe because of him. Now, what might be a good companion verse to this? To, to maybe jot down there next to, next to verse 42. What about Acts 17, 10, and 11? Right? It is that... You know, they, they send Paul and Silas away, uh, and they're Berea, remember? The Bereans are more noble than those in Thessalonica. Not only did they hear the word with all readiness, but they searched the scriptures daily to see if what was said was the truth. That's an excellent companion verse from verse 42 here. They went because initially what they heard. But then they were able to discern that what Christ was saying was true. They didn't just take his word for it. And, and we as Christians, from an evangelistic perspective, we see that people first hear the word, but they're going to test it also. When you tell someone about Christ, they're going to ask, they're going to, they might not ask you, but they're going to observe, are you really the person that you say you are? Are you, do you really believe what you say you believe? And if you fail that test, they reject not only you, but they reject Christ. And they fall into the trap of all Christians are hypocrites. Right? 
They came initially because of what the woman said. Compared today, someone may come to services because of what you said. But then they're, make sure they're going to check those things out. They're going to see if they have any true desire to know the truth. They're going to make sure that what you told them was the truth. Whether by how you live, by how you talk, by how you worship, whatever. Because remember, Christ should touch every aspect of our lives. Are we perfect? No, not in the slightest. But the people aren't looking for perfection. They're looking for believers. And the testing is to continue. I mean, it's not just when someone initially hears the gospel that they're supposed to test that Christian or the preacher or, whatever, or the sermon or whatever the case may be against the word of God. It's to continue on. 1 John 4 and verse 1. 1 John 4 and verse 1. Beloved, do, do not believe every spirit. It's talking to Christians here. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Here we are, first century. And John is writing that many false prophets, they are already out there. Not that they're coming in 2020 or 2021 or anything. No, they are already there. So the world, the spiritual world, has been contaminated with false teachings, false Christian teachings since the time of Christ. So the first thing about that is... We're not going to stop it. So you can put the question out of your mind, what do we do to stop it? You're not going to stop it. It's been going on, you know, since the time of Christ. It's just going to keep going. The only thing that we can do is slow it down. And the way that we slow it down is by teaching the truth. By believing the truth. By worshiping in spirit and in truth. By holding fast to the truth. And trying to yank as many people as we can, as Jude would say, out of the fire heat, hating into the clothes stained with flesh. I know there's some have mercy, but I've been dealing with my niece on that. So, anyhow. But we have to be these, this people. And... Then just closing out, after the two days he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So he came to Galilee. The Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. Remember the feast. Let's start throwing over tables and whipping people. You know? He left for a little bit. Word got around. Now he's back. Yay! You know? The idea really behind the, the woman at the well in, in John chapter 4, there's a lot there. If you're interested at all in, in evangelism, I would suggest going through it with a fine-tooth comb, which we did not do in this class. Yeah, I got some wide eyes when I said that. <laughs> you know, but, but really, go, go through it even more and look at what applies to you personally, uh, to the church different approach, the, the things that Christ speaks, speaks about. Any closing thoughts or comments or